Last I'm coming back for you. Try to stop this recording. No, the sound shall pump into your ears, changing the minds of what you were into the minds of what you shall be. The darkness rises, the small, small voices at the back of your mind that scream and shriek and darken. They say, hello everybody and welcome to the Fluffenhammer. <laughs> we are back once again to talk to you about the worlds and the wonders of the worlds of Games Workshop. Well, I hope that you are well. <laughs> well, Adam's here, ladies and gentlemen. I'm only <laughs> half here. I'm I'm sat here with, with... I'm actually surrounded by books. I'm surrounded by new stuff from Games Workshop, but codices primarily. Um, and I'm kind of I, I'm kind of distracted at the moment. I'm just flipping through um, certain codices that have been obsessing me of late, and seem to have been obsessing the entire community and culture. Um, not terribly surprising because they're very very good indeed. Um, so if I do sort of slip out every now and then, just just assume that. Um, well, something demonic has risen up from the pages of these terms and has snared my mind or possessed my body or something like that. It won't make much difference, so don't worry. <laughs> I do like the idea that you have some kind of liberus that uh, you're just sitting there powering through tome after tome after tome of ancient and forgotten <clears throat> lore. It's not one. It's not entirely uh, beyond the truth. <laughs> 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 to be honest, it's not entirely beyond the truth, and is never um, where where I'm concerned. My little place is so small and so full of books that um, I'm never that far away from something rather dangerous to sanity and soul at any one time. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear! Right. So, well, as George has said, he is surrounded by books, and I am surrounded by goblins. So. <laughs> And you're going to have to excuse us, ladies and gentlemen, because we, we, you're sort of coming into a conversation halfway through here. I mean, we, we, we haven't been able to help it. We've been you know, just, just enthusing about the stuff that's been coming out of Games Workshop of late. And I know, I, I, I hope you're not tired of it. I hope you're not tired of it because it just seems to happen so much in this podcast. The reason being, we started this podcast on the back of a renewed enthusiasm um, yes. and a, indeed a renewed games workshop and it just doesn't seem to sh it doesn't show any sign of stopping we haven't reached any kind of high water mark yet no no the the steam train is still a rolling it uh, so is so be prepared for lots of gushing i'm really sorry i'm not <laughs> no i'm not either actually again slanesh worshiper so it doesn't really matter one way or the other <laughs> I suppose if you're a corn worshipper, it wouldn't matter that much either. It would just be more arterial, wouldn't it? <laughs> well, it would definitely be redder. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm, oh, interesting. Unless you wanted some slaneshi gushing. <laughs> <laughs> well, that could take all manner of forms, can't it? That can take all manner. And you can, you can even have Nurgle gushing as well. It's just not very pleasant <laughs> at all. I don't know what a Zentian gush would be. Would that just be a font you of know, knowledge? I don't even know what that would be. The thing is, with Zeech, it could be anything, couldn't it? It could be anything. I mean, if you think about how, like, the the effluvia of the flamers is described, um, it, it manifests as flame initially, but then it can turn into anything. There's there's actually descriptions of flamers of Zeech. They're, they're flames becoming um, confetti and bones and sprays of milk and honey and blood and just weirdness. It's, Have it's we just, found the 40k cow gun? Yeah, I think, I think, yes, I think oh, so. Oh my word, I have yeah. waited for years to discover another use of the cow gun. Mm -hmm. A gun that I shoots did. bullets, but by the time the bullet hits you, it is a full-grown cow. Well, that that's very possible, where Zeech is concerned, by all accounts. That's very possible, and indeed likely. 
And that's why Zench and Zeech are my personal favourite of the oh, Pantheon. You're a, ah, Zeech is oh. your favourite, is it? Oh, yeah, yes, without a shadow. Without that's a shadow of a doubt. Interesting. I like that. I do like to that. Be fair, I like though, Zeech too. To be fair, Nurgle is champing at his heels these days. Oh, I tell you, you know what? Nurgle, Nurgle is a pain in the arse. He really is. I he Slanesh is my my unambiguous favourite. I love everything about Slanesh. Slanesh is the kind of divinity that resonates with the the, the deities I like in actual mythologies. You know, mm-hmm. characters like Dionysus and. Bacchus and I like those characters um Tiamat from really ancient mythology yeah. I love those characters and Slanesh is for me one of the most legitimately divine of the pantheon it's the kind of god that I would worship if I thought it existed um don't know what that says about well, me d- but um <laughs> does Nurgle, it need to exist if you started no, worshiping it, it would it then exist uh we're getting into metaphysics now and it's getting it's far too late in the evening for that um <laughs> But Nurgle is very, very close, mm-hmm. I can tell you. And getting closer all the damn time. Yeah. Um, I don't know what it is, though. What I really like about Nurgle is the contradiction of him. I like the fact that he is, on the face of it, to want to, to enjoy Nurgle, to want to worship Nurgle and to take pleasure in something like Nurgle is kind of insanity. It's, it's absolute insanity because he is everything most, that most people fear. You know, he's disease, he's cancer, he's he's decrepitude, he's the loss of your mind, he's the loss of your sanity, um, he's the, the loss of everything, he's uh, the decay of beauty and of thought and of, of everything. But he is attractive. Yeah. I don't know why that is. It's really bizarre. And I, I like the fact that you've got that complexity in what is ostensibly a hobby, you know, in what is... <laughs> it's, it's fun, it's a silly... It, it, it is on the face of it a kind of silly um, very hyperbolic mythology but you have these resonant depths that, that that require deeper discussion or at least allow for deeper discussion if you want it Yeah, well, it's, I like that the, the idea of Nogal um, you can take it to the place where it's a, a very real fear and once you remove mm. that fear what is there left to be scared of it's a fair point, actually. And now that that that's really interesting because that is exactly that is exactly one of the psychological points that's discussed in the Liber Chaotica Nurgle. Is it? You know where oh, it right. is. Where well, Richter Kleist goes into. I mean, one of the one of the points of the Liber Chaotica Nurgle is that Richter Kleist, the the Sigmarite priest who's writing it, he tries to explain why anyone would worship. A, a god like Nurgle, why he and in, in fact why his influence is so widespread. He's actually one of the more powerful of the pantheon. His his influence is very strong, and in fact it changes, it waxes and wanes like a disease does, like a pandemic does. So there are times when Nurgle's influence is so great that he eclipses all the other gods, and then he wanes again. Okay. And he actually becomes one of the weaker. Yeah, that's the nature of his power. It's like a pandemic. It's just the, it's part of his elemental nature. But what Richter points out is that as you exactly as you've just said, he doesn't coerce or seduce in the way that Zeech does, for example. Zeech doesn't even bother coer. It doesn't bother seducing by and large. Zeech's servants often don't even know they are his servants. No, or they, that's they why actively I love him. act. It's why he's so cool. Uh, or in fact, they even they even consist of characters that actively act against him, like yes. Araman, like yeah. Araman. Araman is definitely a puppet of Zeech. He is definitely a puppet of Zeech. He's been ensnared since the moment he was born, and probably beforehand. But he doesn't know it, doesn't acknowledge it, doesn't accept it, and in fact hates Zeech. Mm-hmm. He hates him with a fiery fiery passion which is just as strong an emotion as love you know it, it, it still fuels him that's that's the well, wonderful the thing point. about it especially this is the point yeah zeech is is empowered by that because araman is trying to change his state he's a re- he's like a revolutionary you know mm-hmm. he's trying to change his state and that empowers zeech that totally empowers zeech whereas nurgle nurgle places people in positions where they have no choice <laughs> you know uh, they, they've they, lost everything they have to turn to Papa Nurgle because the 
well, the alternative is just too horrible to consider. It's better to have lost everything and no longer mm. be afraid than to be Absolutely. afraid until the very last moment. That's right, and you've you've already faced the worst. Yeah, you've already faced the worst. So what 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 else is there? And the best of it is, he makes them better. He doesn't he doesn't cure them from whatever affliction they've got. Oh no 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 no! But he does make them better in the sense mm-hmm. that he gives them purpose in it, in their yes. suffering. He actually makes them feel as though their suffering is something worthwhile, and that's mm-hmm. what's so complicated about him. It's so complicated, and it's something that a god like Nurgle would require. I mean, Slanesh worship is easy. Any, you can definitely see why anyone would fall to Slanesh worship. Yeah. And not even realize they have. It could be through yeah. something as simple as like artistic appreciation or because of... Um, just because of falling in love or something like that. It can be any, anything you take pleasure, pride or satisfaction in yeah. can lead you down Slanesh <clears throat> worship. Um, Once it but gets to Nurgle, the... Once it gets to an extremist Sorry, level, that yeah, that's it. That's mm. that's when Slanish gets hold of you, when that mm. uh, hedonistic approach to anything comes to the mm. forefront. Um, and it doesn't just have to be a hedonistic, hedonistic approach to sexual behaviour. It could be no. once you start going down an opium path, you know, that's a very mm-hmm. easy one. But as you say, it can be artistic licensing. It could be taking so much pleasure in the creation of art that eventually you start creating things that people would say, no, that's blasphemous, blasphemy. Mm-hmm. So who are you going to turn to? You're going to turn to the one person who sees the art as being art. Absolutely. And being blasphemy. Yeah. Um, but he's also, he's not just the extreme, you know. That's the interesting thing about Slanesh. And it's something that a lot of the the sort of more generally accepted fluff actually misses. He does, he's more empowered by the extreme. That's definitely the case. And yeah. if you go, if you fall into Slanesh worship, eventually you will move towards that, those extremes, regardless of what it is, whether it's, it's you know, you can be a, a gourmand, for example. You can be an appreciator of food and wine and, and comforts. And you will eventually become a glutton. You, it will become more and more extreme as time goes on, because that's just the nature of Slanesh worship. But he also incorporates any form of pleasure yes. and any form of satisfaction and any form of love or pride or inspiration. All of that is Slanesh, all of it. Um, there is actually a great interview in the Liber Chaotica Slanesh between Richter Kleiss and the Slanesh uh, cultist, um, a very, very debonair man um, named uh, the Marquis d'Almanche. Um, <laughs> now that's a... Have you, I, I, do, you rec- do you recognize the reference? I do, yes. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a reference to the Marquis de Sade. Yeah. Um, and d'Almanche is actually a character from one of uh, the Marquis de Sade's books, which is Philosophy in the Boudoir. Um, and the Marquis del Manche, the fun thing about the Marquis del Manche is that he is not what you would expect a chaos cultist to be. He is not some ravening fanatic. He is not um, some self-mutilating decadent. He's a debonair, witty, charming man, um, even when he's imprisoned. Because, of course, he's a Slanesh cultist. So it doesn't matter to him that he's imprisoned. It doesn't matter to him that he's being tortured by the Sigmarite priest. He rather enjoys it. Um, he's comfortable wherever the hell he is. And he is very happy to talk to Richter and to indulge him in his interviews. And what he points out to Richter, which Richter finds very hard to take and gets rather riled up by, is that even the pleasure that Richter takes in his daily rites, in his worship of Sigmar, empowers Slanesh. So whether he likes it or not, even when he feels he's worshipping Sigmar, he's feeding Slanesh. There is no escape from this. That's amazing. (laughs) It's great, isn't it? And there's nothing, there really is nothing you can do about it. There is nothing you can do about it. You will, one way or another, be feeding one or more of the chaos powers at any one time. Uh, Not consciously, you just are. Just by virtue of your existence. Wow. (laughs) It's great, isn't it? It's great. And this is why I love uh, doing this show with you, fella. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so I, well i just i love that's the kind of thing i love that's the kind of detail i absolutely love about this game and this these mythologies this is what i love um but yeah i mean it, it provides a stark contrast to nurgle worship in that regard because although nurgle followers when they're, they're when they're at a particular point of worship they do start to take incredible pleasure in their states and their conditions and there's there's some really horrible details about how 
their their perceptions twist so that they start to perceive disgusting and wretched states as beautiful and they start to regard their extreme myopia and conservatism of mind as enlightened so there is only one way and it's nurgle's way <laughs> it's the way of disease it's the way of putrefaction it's the way of despair despair in in the mind of someone who is touched by nurgle and who eventually opens themselves up i mean they, they, he brings them to such a point that they have no choice they have no choice but to surrender. And the strongest of wills are the ones that he takes most pleasure in breaking. So it would have been the likes of Mortarion, for example, yeah, yeah. Who, who no doubt endured f for such a long time. I mean, there's no measure in the actual background as to how long Mortarion endured in the war when he caught the Destroyer Plague. But we know it's a long time much longer than all of his other all of the other plague marines and we also know that he suffered the worst of all of them which he would of course he's a primarch he doesn't mm -hmm. get diseases it doesn't the notion that he can be laid low by a disease by an infection is ridiculous so and he also he defines by his strength by his ability to endure so to have that taken away <laughs> it's it's despair and torture on a number of levels, but that's the kind of will and defiance that absolutely empowers Nurgle, because it's not just the breaking, it's the defiance that is demonstrated mm. up to the point of breaking that empowers him. He's not interested in people who just roll over. No, no, it has to be a, a fight. It has, it has to, to be, be a fight. Yeah. It has to be somebody who, like, who rises from the ashes of their despair and takes a kind of grim and bitter poetry from it, who finds some meaning in it. So there was a long time ago, it was back in the days, do you remember when the original Storm of Chaos campaign occurred? I do, yes. Oh, back, uh, long time ago. Was, yeah, quite a ways away. It was back when Archaon really first made his... He, he, it wasn't the first time he appeared, but it was the first time he really made an impact in the Warhammer world as yes, was. Yes, yes. Um, it was when that lovely new model of him came out of on on Dorgar, yeah. on the, the, the steed of the apocalypse, as it was back then. Um, <laughs> back then, there was this these wonderful bits of fluff in the background about um, there were four generals, one for each of the chaos gods, who led the they united the various hordes and tribes in uh, the the north of the old world, um, and each one had this background to them. They weren't special characters; they were just in the background. You know, you could make them using the army list as existed back then. Okay. Um, and the one that was dedicated to Nurgle was really interesting because he wasn't a, a Norseman; he wasn't a tribesman initially. He was a farmer. He was a farmer who existed um, sort of toward, not in the far north, but towards the north of the Sigmarite Empire. Yeah, okay. And there was, I, I can't quite remember what happened, but it was, there was um, a pandemic. There was a plague that swept throughout his village and killed most people. But he survived. And when the Sigmarite priests came and the witch hunters, they immediately assumed that everyone was blighted by Nurgle and put everyone to the, to the torch, put everyone to the flame. And he fought his way free. He survived. And it's through that, it's through that, that complete and utter abjection, that complete despair that Nurgle finds him and that he declares for Nurgle and becomes uh, sort of like an arch messiah of the play god. But that's the kind of situation that you find with Nurgle's followers. It's n very rarely the case that they just bend over and start worshipping him, you know? <laughs> It just doesn't work like that. It's that they are in situations where they have no choice. And then afterwards, they start to learn what Nurgle is. And they start to find sort of the philosophy of Nurgle and start to take pleasure in it. It's really cool. And of course, because we've gone through all the other Chaos Powers, Korn likes to hit stuff. Korn is just, re again, Korn's really simple. Yeah. You've got you've got really simple chaos powers in terms of their seductions, which is Slanesh and Corn. Yeah. They're very easy, very easy to fall into. I mean, someone who just lashes out in a moment of anger, that's it. They could they open themselves to corn. And it doesn't matter how minor that, that action is. And it could even be suppressed anger that leads to corn worship. Anything anything that involves anger or rage or martial pride. That's what's can... gonna say there there is always the martial prowess side of it as well. Mm. But that... that's really interesting too. 
Yeah. Because he shows some overlap with Slanesh there. He does, because Marshall he? Pride yeah. yeah, Marshall Pride is a Slanesh thing too. That, it's one of those rare instances where you get the overlap between the gods. Yeah, but especially the overlap between Corn and Slanesh, that's they're rare. Yeah. They are rare because they're Antipodean. Those two are on op you know the chaos stuff. Yes. Yeah. Those two are on opposite ends of it, in the same way that Zeech and Nurgle mm-hmm. are. Um very far opposite ends. But they do they all still have certain things in common. Yes. Sorry. I mean, take for example, I mean, Slanesh is the easiest because every advocates of every single one of the chaos powers take pleasure in what they do or take some degree of satisfaction in it. And in that, there is an element of Slanesh worship. Yeah. So there is, there is sincere overlap there. Um, but Nurgle and Zeech are far more complex they are. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons I like Zinch. Zinch, Zinch, however you pronounce it. I always pronounce it Zinch. I can't help myself. I always pronounce it Zinch. But you know what? There is no... It's one of those things. There is no absolute... That, that's why it's spelt the way it yes. is. Totally. There's no there's no definite pronunciation. It reminds me a little bit of Lovecraft, you know? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that Nub Shagaruth and... Uh... All the, the joys of trying to pronounce Cthulhu when you're 12 years old. Exactly. Exactly. Have you read <laughs> Lovecraft's letters on the matter? Yes. <laughs> I mean, he was he was written to all the time by people asking, well, how do you pronounce this? Well, how do you pronounce that? And he always said, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It's not... Desi- I mean, the thing about, say, Cthulhu, for example, mm-hmm. that's not how you pronounce it. All that is, is as close as human language and a human... Sort of, the sort of human vocal apparatus can come. Yeah. To pronouncing that ent- one of that entity's many, 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 many names. I mean, That's... the actual pronunciation would be like a little bit. Exactly, you, you, you can't you, pronounce it. You need an extra tongue to be able to get it right. Exactly, and not only that, but it probably resonates on multiple different metaphysical levels. So you'd need like some sort of abstract apparatus in order to pronounce it correctly, and it would probably have all sorts of. A weird extra dimensional wibbly resonances that would cause cascades throughout reality if you could pronounce it correctly. The same is true of the Chaos Gods. Even pronouncing it, one of their, and all the Chaos Gods have got multiple names. That's true, they do. Uh, you know, Zeech is sometimes called Shunch, mm-hmm. um, he's sometimes called Zenith, um, he's sometimes called Makar. Um, Slanesh is sometimes called Slaneth or Lantshore or Shornal. Um, Corn is sometimes called Carneth, or uh, there's, there's a lot. I can't remember many of Corn's names. Carneth, Carneth, I think is his true name, isn't it? Yes, if I remember correctly. Carneth is the name that he was originally given, and Corn is like a derivation or something yeah, like that. It is. Um, I seem to remember in the old um, Warhammer Armies, Nors- was it Norska? Mm, oh, I can't remember. Mm, it's been uh, it's, it's uh, one of the Warhammer Armies chaos books, anyhow, that, that yeah, dealt with yeah. the Norse tribes. Um, mm-hmm. And I always remember that uh, they kept calling him the Great Red Raven. The Great Red Raven, that's nice. Yeah. I like that. And it's, it's one of those ones that cool. sticks in my mind so well. Well, that's interesting because some of the um, the older Warhammer, the Warhammer ones more than the 40k ones, actually. Because the, the, what's interesting is that the Chaos Gods are more prominent in the Chaos Armies of the fantasy setting than they are in the 40k setting they're definitely there but if you look at the chaos armies in the 40k setting they've all got their own motivations they've all got their own axes to grind yeah. and their own backgrounds which is actually really strong and i like that because it, it lends them dynamism but if you look at the old books on the chaos warrior tribes the norska mm-hmm. tribes they go into great detail on the aspects that the chaos powers have and they all have not only elemental aspects so they all have a certain element that is associated with them so corn is fire zeech is air slanesh is water and nurgle is earth um but they also have animals associated with them too animal aspects now corn is usually a hound yes he's the great hound it's usually a wolf or like a bloodhound or hence the the appearance of some of his demons Um, like the the flesh hounds And some of his like demon princes and greater demons have got dog heads as well. They've got sort of like dog headed uh, qualities. Um, the original uh, bloodthirster, for example. Oh, the original bloodthirster with its do- many dog yeah. heads. Not just one. It's got many dog heads. Uh, some of which are skull like. Some of which are more bear like. Mm. 
Uh, yeah, one of which has got a lovely skull helm with wings on it that looks like the prototype Night Lord's head. It does, actually, now you come to mention it. And the, the cool thing about that, of um, course, is that then led off to be the uh, the basis for one of my favourite miniatures of all time, the Hero Quest Gargoyle. Oh, yes, yeah, which basically is, I mean, it is a gargoyle of a bloodthirster. Yes, it pretty it's, much is, yeah. yeah. It's, it's a gargoyle of a bloodthirster, even to the point whereby, like, the, the style of the um, gargoyle's helmet is the, it's the stylized corn it rune. It is, yep. <laughs> the skull, you know, the skull rune that she's part of. I mean, you can even find derivations of that now. Yeah. If you look at the Wrath of Corn bloodthirster, um, it's got that helmet. Yeah. Which is it's got that helmet, which is so cool. I, I mean, that's something I love. It's something I love to see in the new miniatures ranges, the way you've got throwbacks to certain old concepts. I, I want a new hero quest, George. I really want a oh, new hero man. quest. <laughs> uh, you know, it's not, it's definitely not outside the realms of possibility. I think if it was going to happen, it's it would not... have happened for the 25th anniversary. Uh, yeah, that's that, and also one of the one of the issues. There may be copyright. There's problems massive copyright because, problems. Yeah, because of the whole thing with MB yeah, and whatnot, yeah. that might make it difficult. Although you know what, they could get round that. I can, they could I get can round get that. that. They could just, I just don't call it Hero yeah, Quest. Exactly, don't call it Hero Quest. Make it more or less the same, and just put the equivalent models in there. So it's not a gargoyle; it's a bloodthirster. <laughs> you know, it, that's the easiest thing on earth to do. You don't call it a gargoyle; you call war. it a war statue. And a war statue, yeah. yes, uh, a profane idol. Yes. There, there you something. go. We call it the profane idol. Um, and instead there you of, are. Uh, easy, thinner, easy. We have one-eyed rape lizards. Um, <laughs> and... I sincerely want there to be a creature in in the background called a one-eyed rape lizard. They're, they're that would be the Fimir, actually, definitely. And when we get to talking about the Fimir in detail, you'll understand why they're one-eyed rape lizards. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. I mean, that was always one of my favourite miniatures in Hero Quest. Oh, the Fimir, yeah. I, I, I always loved it. I loved it because it was so unusual. I mean, you see an orc, and an orc is an orc is an orc. They're yeah. pretty much the same in anything they occur in, aren't they? Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, an orc in Warhammer is pretty. They're not exactly the same, but they're pretty much the orcs from Tolkien, um, and the orcs that as they're found in pretty much any mythology or game or whatever. Well, they're the same. Kind of what when Warhammer first started off, then yes, they were very much the the similar. Um, the fact that they were green instead of brown was the only there to differentiate them mm. from the uh, Dungeons and Dragons. But as yep. time's gone on, um, they got to a certain point, and then Warcraft came along and took them as they were at that mm. point. Because Warcraft is a really weird one. If you look at the first Warcraft game, you have late mm. '90s orcs from Games Workshop. Mm -hmm. It's a really interesting watermark, and then they go off on their own little thing, and they. They become yeah, their own. They become their own orcs. Yeah, I yeah. freaking love the Warcraft orcs. They are. <laughs> oh, the, the idea of the tortured hero is. Um, mm, yes. Mm. Mm, lovely. I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? Because there are multiple mythologies to where orcs come from. I mean, you've got the classic Tolkien yeah. one, where they are essentially um, derivatives of tortured yes. elves. Um, they're a sort of ruined version of elves taken by Morgoth, the original Dark Lord, and tortured and mutilated and driven mad and then bred until there are this entire species that is effectively evil incarnate. Yeah. You know, they're everything negative, everything dark and base and unpleasant. Uh, the exact opposite of the elves. You know, they, they are supposed to be an, an insult. They're, it's Morgoth raising one finger to Iluvatar, the, the, the sort of great god of, of Middle-earth and of the, the Tolkien mythology who created everything. Because the elves are supposed to be his chosen mm -hmm, children. Yeah. You know, they're his first creations. Um, you've got the, um, the Warhammer orcs and the Warhammer 40k orcs that are something totally different. But they're the same in ter they're very similar in terms of character and appearance, but they're in terms of background totally yeah, they, totally they, they've evolved different. down completely different lines i mean the, the orcs in yeah, warhammer you... are um humanoid creatures whilst in 40k mm. they're fungus they're fungus yeah. yeah they're actually plant creatures which i really love uh, yeah. i mean i remember reading that that for the first time and i was like what <laughs> what that's mental but it actually makes a hell of a lot of yeah. sense because there are lots of them they crop up everywhere, do mm -hmm. orcs. And if you think of them in a sort of um, Day of the Triffids kind of way, 
where you've got these cosmic spores floating through space and seeding themselves on planets and just erupting at particular points. That makes a hell of a lot of sense, and I like it a I, lot. I, I like the, uh, the the way it works, where you got the the squigs come first, so there's an ecosystem. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then you know, squigs and plants come first, then the uh, mm. the Gretchen pop out, and only then mm. do the orcs start to appear. And then you've got yeah, six generations yeah, yeah. of orcs before the, the mutations appear. So you start getting the mech boys and the weird boys. Uh-huh. And it, oh, it's uh, so well done. It's so well thought out. An entire life yeah. cycle. I love it. I love that. And in that, they've got a certain a kind of relationship to the Tyranids in that regard. They are very much the plant equivalent of yeah. the Tyranids. Yeah. The, Which is interesting. They, this universe's version of Tyranids. Yeah. This galaxy's version. Of, yeah, yeah, I yeah, like that's, that. That's quite a nice thought. I do like yeah. that a lot, actually. Um, also, I mean, um, we're going to see all of this, of course. I mean, th- this is all coming down the road. I mean, it, it, but from what I understand, next year is the Xenos year, isn't yes. it? Yes. Yep. As f- That's what I understand. So th- for the rest of this year, all we're going to get are Imperial and Chaos codices. That's how I understand it. I... That's what my, I understand. My little sources tell and... me that um, we should see a codex a month between now and the end of the year. Oh, fucking brilliant. Oh, that is so Ouch. brilliant. And you know what? Given the rate they're churning them out, I can well believe oh, yeah, it. Yeah. Um, I can well believe it. I mean, it's, it's actually becoming difficult to keep up with the it damn is. things. It is. I've had to make some very serious choices of what do, what do I want and what do I need, don't want. Absolutely. Same here. Same. I mean, I definitely wanted the, the Space Marine Codex because you, you need it as a sort of barometer yes. for how things are going to go. Yeah. You really do. If you look at the Space Marine Codex in most editions of 40k, you can tell how things are going to go. You can see what's going to happen. And of course, given that 8th Ed is so different from all of the editions that have gone before, it's a very good barometer of of what format they're using for the codices, but how also how they're flavoring and theming and constructing the armies um and in that regard it's a it's it's very promising <laughs> i must say it is very promising it's indeed. a little bit more than very promising <laughs> yeah, yeah it really is it really is i mean i i i was reading the codex earlier in preparation for this and i've read it cover to cover i've read the whole codex and i rarely do that with space marine codex codices because there's so much material in Space Marine Codices that is just reprinted from edition to edition to edition <laughs> to edition. And it's always the same. You always get the Horus Heresy. You always get stuff about Ultramar. You always get um, like the uh, the Civil Wars. You always get the creation of the Space Marines. You always get that stuff. You always get the fight between Horus and the Emperor and so on and so forth. And it's always the same. So you just skip over that. And also because it's always reprinted in the main rule book as well, that stuff. Yeah. But that's it's always reprinted in the the main rule book because it's so prominent. It's so important to the background. Well, it's the, the backbone, but, isn't it? The the fo- the yep. Space Marine Codex has to be the backbone of the 40k universe to get yep. you the player in- it does. interested. It does. I mean there are some people online who find that a little bit contentious, but it's true. They they are they're the face of the IP, aren't they? They are the face of the IP and they are the background of the universe. So there. It's go it, that's just the case. But as they go, I I love this codex. I absolutely love it. It's always been the case when a new Space Marine codex comes out, I've always been really apprehensive. Really apprehensive. And if you look back Really, it's they've had a very strange history of the Space Marine Codices. If you look back, say, to Second Ed mm-hmm. and the first Space Marine Codices, they aren't very good. <laughs> they aren't very good at all. You had the generic Space Marine Codex, which was the actually the Ultramarines Codex back then. That was the, the generic Space Marine Codex back then. It was Codex Ultramarines, and that was the one that you made most of the chapters from. Then you had things like the Angels of Death Codex, which actually had two legions in it. It had the two chapters in it. It had the Blood Angels and the Dark Angels rammed together in one codex. And then you had Codex Space Wolves. And that, those were the only ones that existed back then for the Space Marines. And they're not very good. They're very well written. They're very fun to read, but as army lists goes, they actually, they're not very good in comparison to, say, the Orcs or the Chaos Space Marines back then, or certainly not against the Tyranids or the Eldar. Those codex codices back then were, were insane. And that <laughs> seemed to be the case right through 
early third yeah. ed right up until fourth ed when everything changed yes. everything changed and when they really started to, to to concentrate on the space marines and realize look look this army is very important to the background and they deserve a bit better they definitely deserve a bit better which is definitely the case i i definitely I, i'm definitely with that they they do deserve a good codex the space marines uh, the problem is that they then swung around to the other extreme yeah and you got a situation where every space marine codex superseded all of the others yep all of the others they could do everything that all the other armies could do and do it better with the possible exception of craft world elder <laughs> yeah it got it got ridiculous <laughs> when i it, i don't yeah. want to use the term because it's been used so many times but there's no other term mm -hmm. for it when they got warded <laughs> um, yes especially the ultramarines they became the most mm. ridiculous unplayable wins by yep. default force it, yep. to the point where no, do you know when it to came to yet. a head no absolutely you know when it came to a head when was that quite recently quite recently that would have been with the release of the last space marines codex for seventh mm -hmm. Ed. now you have to bear in mind the very fact of there being another space marine codex in seventh ed was a point of contention yeah, anyway yeah. because certainly for chaos players like myself because we had been struggling with the same codex since the beginning of sixth ed and it wasn't very good even back then at the point of release it wasn't very good by that point space marines had had two codex mm. releases with attendant models yeah. not very happy now the last space marines codex for seventh ed was ridiculous it was absolutely ridiculous. It gave you a Decurian detachment that allowed you, if you fulfilled it, and fulfilling it wasn't very hard at all, and gave you a very balanced army mm -hmm. indeed. It gave you free transports. What? Yeah. You could take as many rhinos and whatnot as you liked, and they were free. And bearing in mind, some units, some units don't just take rhinos... Mm. They take drop yeah. pods. They take um, some units. Take land raiders. Fucking hell! I know. Why? How, how? It's ridiculous. What? Yeah, it got to the point where people were like, you know what? If you're going to play that detachment, if you're going to play that decurion, we're not playing. Yeah, no, I'm not surprised. <laughs> we're not playing. It's pointless. And, you know, I'm not. I, I. It is pointless. It is, and I, I am not. I don't play the game to win. Really, I play it because of the 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 silliness of it. Really, I play for role playing yes, purposes. Yes. But there does they they came, they got to a point where it was like it was just pulling mm -hmm. teeth. There was a point. There were certain armies you could put down in seventh ed where nobody wanted to play them, and that was one of them. This codex, the new, the first codex Space Marines for eighth ed, does away with all of that. It does away with all of it. It is like being able to breathe again. And you know what? Even Space Marine players have been saying this because Space Marine players, actually, by and large, are not power players. They're just not. They tend to be. They tend to be people who are in love with their chapters. Yes, that's you true. You know, they're people yeah. who feel real, real connections with whatever chapter they've chosen or whatever chapter they've come up with. I mean, there are lots of people out there who make their own chapters, which is very possible, um, and they like. They like they they do have generally a great sense of fair play, and they didn't like it either. They didn't like that their codex was was just ridiculously overpowered against everybody else because nobody wanted to play them, and they got tired of hearing people grumble about it. Particularly Chaos Space Marine <laughs> players. I mean, it, it's it did get to the point where certain forums, uh, Bolter and Chainsword, for example, which I love very much. I'm a big fan of the Bolter and Chainsword, uh, but they they had to censor their Chaos forums. <laughs> <laughs> because really? every other thread every other thread was complaining and i'm not surprised i'm not surprised that was the case because it was a bad time it was a bad bad time but i tell you what this new space marine codex has done away with all so of what's that. actually in it because what, it's, tell me all about the new space marine codex what is yeah. in the new space marine codex well you've got all the usual stuff you know there is all of the background you would expect to be in here is in here but you know what there's a lot of it that's been rewritten so it's not just the same stuff reprinted Copied again, and pasted which yeah. 
Ah, I'm so pleased about. It makes it... I mean, it is the same stuff. It's the same details. It's the same basic story and back mythology, but because it's been rewritten, it has curious little new emphases in it and certain details that have been brought into the fore that were not before. So it makes it fresh. It makes it interesting again. It's not like, oh, well, there's the, the st- here's the pages about the Great Crusade. They've, I've read that a million times, so I'm just going to mm-hmm. flip over that because I've read it. No, 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 no. It's fun to read. It's actually fun to read again. And that's great. And it's also, it's much shorter. Although the codex is massive, it's really ram-packed with detail, the old stuff is much shorter. It assumes that you're going to get it from somewhere else. It assumes that you're going to go read the Horus Heresy books, that you're going to go and find the old codices, or that you're just going to know yeah. it. You're just going to get it because you're part of, you know, you are going to find it somewhere else, so it doesn't belabor itself. That's cool. Which, wonderful. It just it just lends it a pace. It also it does a wonderful thing where, do you remember the old... Um, Index of Starte's articles in White Dwarf that are sometimes compiled. They've reprinted some of them in here, which is really cool. They've reprinted... There was one that I remember loving, and I remember reading it a lot, which is The Making of a Space Marine, The Genesis of a Space Marine. And it's got, from beginning to end, it details how space marines are created, how they're selected, how people are chosen to become space marines, how they are tested, and then how they are altered, how they are surgically, genetically, and psychologically altered to become space marines. And it goes into the most exacting detail, to the point whereby you've got a list of all the extra organs that are inserted into them and what Mm -hmm. they all do what they perform um but not only that the article is updated the article is massively updated to uh describe the genesis of the primaris space marines as well and the primaris space marines have an entire list of organs that the original space marines don't (laughs) so that's really cool. They have a thing, for example, they have a thing called the sinew coils. And uh, basically, the the sinews of a Primaris space marine are laced with a kind of metal or a kind of mm-hmm. alloy, which means that their grip and their, their, their sort of... the Their recoil, the strength of their reactions is much greater. Right, okay. And they're also more durable. They're more durable. It means that they can withstand a lot of punishment, these guys. Um, they have a thing called the Magnificat, or the Amplifier, um, which is a small thumbnail-sized lobe that is inserted into the brain's core. The Magnificat secretes hormones that increase the body's growth functions, whilst also intensifying its advanced systems. So basically, it means that these guys are going to be bigger. Yeah. They're going to be bigger than normal space moves. They're going to be bulkier. They're going to have more muscle mass. They're going to have more bone density it's just cool it's an old article just slightly rewritten rejigged and updated and that's what you find all the way through this they've realized that they can't just give you the background on space marines verbatim anymore it just doesn't work anymore because everybody knows it everybody knows it people who haven't ever played this damn game (laughs) who have lived the last god knows how many decades in an alternate dimension in a cave on mars with their fingers in their ears and their eyes sewn shut know the story and the history of the space marines yeah it's like it's like the origin of spider-man you know yes everybody knows everybody the knows Wayne's parents and were shot dead in a dirty filthy alleyway yeah exactly exactly so what they've done is tried to make it new they tried to make it fresh and they've really succeeded it's really fun there's lots there's not only the old stuff but there are little insertions of stuff from the horus heresy little suggestions of stuff from the from the books and the novels and there's a there's much a, a much greater sense of interplay between the general background and the background that appears in the horus heresy books now too which is really really nice then we've got all the new stuff the really new stuff like the there's the history of the chapters as we know them but now there's all this updated stuff about what they're doing in the new imperium in um imperium primaris as it's known and with regards to um dawn's primaris crusade or the indomitus crusade or whatever it's called uh there's a lot of new detail on that and it's really interesting it's really cool not only that but you get some lovely details on successor chapters. Oh. 
if you don't want to go down the beaten path there's lots of new chapters in here um like the unknown foundings lots of stuff on the unknown foundings there's new uh, primaris chapters that are described Wait, here this entire chapter really, is really primaris nice. oh yeah there aren't many but they do exist yeah oh that's very they definitely cool. do yeah, they definitely do. And there's also um, details on how the existing chapters are responding to the Primaris Marines, but also to to Gilliman's Gil mm -hmm. resurrection and the fact that he's basically taken over the Imperium. There's lots of lovely new tensions making themselves known here. You've basically got an entire section on each chapter. And then after the existing history and the updated history you've got these lovely little tidbits of what they've been up to since the resurrection of Gilliman and the the eruption of the cicatrix maledictum where they are what what fronts they're fighting on and what is affecting them philosophically there's a lot of that in here too like how are they responding to the new state of play and that's the best stuff in the codex quite frankly because yeah. it's new and it's interesting and, and it's changing them slightly it's giving them just slightly new emphases and like a new dynamic in the universe it's moving like the that. the story forward in a very real and very interesting manner isn't it it really is i mean it, and some of them some of them are, are like they're in particular places at the moment they are focused in particular places in the universe they're sort of scattered all over fighting on lots of different fronts and i really like that i really really like that it's so so cool. It's a it's a stunner. It's a, and on top of that, you've got all of the new units for the Primaris Marines as well. And there's more than what we've originally seen. There are lots and lots and lots of new units in this book, and it's kind of irons out how the Primaris Marines relate to the the original Marines. It, it irons out that that kind yeah. of wrinkle. You know, where people were afraid that maybe they're going to supplant the, the the original Marines. That's not the case. That's definitely not the case. Because the Primaris Marines are so specialized, you see. That's... They are they're very mm -hmm. strong. They're very good at what they do. They're some of the best units at what they do, in fact. But they're not that... Uh, broad they're not as adaptable as existing space marines you know how you, you, your tactical squad is pretty good at everything your basic tactical squad yes, of space yes. marines is pretty good at everything they can be made to to weather any storm really or to fulfill any battlefield role um, that's not the case for the primaris units at all in fact what the primaris units mostly resemble in terms of how they function in the army list is a bit like the chaos cults you know, yeah. you've got the Corn Berserkers and the Noise Marines and the Thousand Suns. They're more like that. They've got a... Although not, they're not just like the Imperial equivalents of those. That would be really <laughs> annoying. <laughs> That's not the case. They're their own things. They, they fulfill their own roles. So you've got things like the... Um, now, hang on. Let me find the page. You've got lots of specialized little units, essentially, that do very, very, very particular things as as well as that you've got lots of different types of terminator now too lot in fact there are four different types of terminator squad available to imperial space marines now that all do something slightly different which is really 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 wow. cool i know right it just lends them i mean this is this is just the basic army list too this is before you start getting into things like chapter tactics um which allow you to specialize even further um, before you start looking at stuff like warlord traits and psychic powers and it's it's such a good army list <laughs> it's such a good fun army list it's and it also it, it really makes overt how these how the new yeah, state yeah. of play is going to work yeah so what you've got a lot of the um special rules have been removed from units it's not the case that You've got a unit that's got a special rule, and that's it. That's how it works. Now, a lot of the time, although they do have their own special rules, they do have some. Now, it's the case that you have your command points, which are you develop based on how your army is structured, yeah? So, you will have a certain amount of command points based on how your army is structured. If it's, if it's organized into particular detachments, then each detachment rewards a particular number of command points for use in the game. And you expend command points to activate um, stratagems. 
And stratagems are specialised rules that can be applied to particular units in particular circumstances. There are even chapter-specific stratagems that operate on top of or in conjunction with the chapter tactics to specialise units even further. But you've got to think about how and when you deploy them. Because once you've expended the command points, you've expended them and that's it. So you'll only have a limited number per game. It lends this wonderful layer of not only strategy to the games, but character as well. Because you can have units that maybe are not that great or which are not doing very well. Suddenly you apply a particular chapter, ta or a particular stratagem to them. And suddenly they're, they're basically ripping through the enemy in that turn. Okay. But only for that turn. That's, it's lots of that fun. That sounds for like example, a, uh, It's uh, great it, fun. It, it's a bit of narrative, isn't it? It's the the, the rules feed the narrative yeah. rather than the rules being a winning, yeah, Absolutely. Like winning part. That's exactly mm. it. That's exactly it. And it means that each unit has, has use. There are no redundant units anymore in this codex. They've all been balanced out, they've all been ironed out, and I can see why you would take any one of them. Any one of them. But then you can make them even more interesting, and even more dynamic, and even more useful by applying um, stratagems to them. It's brilliant. Yeah. It's loads so, of fun. With all that being said then, what about the Chaos book? Because I, I know that you're champing at the bit to talk about the Chaos uh, book. Well, I am, I am. I mean, I, ha you know, the Space Marines book is great. It really is. And the fact that I'm even saying that, you know, after mm -hmm. so many years of resenting it um, is, is testament to how good it is. But the one that I've been waiting for, definitely, the one that was for me the big acid test, it was whether I was going to throw myself into 8th edition wholeheartedly was the Chaos Space Marine Codex. And it's... It's, it's, it's above and beyond any expectation I might have had. Any hope or expectation I might have had. It's probably the best codex we've had for years. For, for years and years and years. It's, for me, I think I like it better than the 3.5 really? codex. Yeah. Okay. I think I like it better. The, the, the 3. Point, yeah, the 3.5 codex was great. Don't get yeah. me wrong. I really enjoyed it. But... It did have problems. One of the problems with the 3.5 codes true. was yeah. how open to abuse it was. And that potential for abuse is arguably what informed the state of chaos in 40k for the decades that followed. It was so overbalanced, that codex, that there was a point where you, if you went into a games workshop, you would be yes, fighting against the chaos were. army. Yeah. The, the... That's... You always were. And it would often be an Iron Warriors <laughs> army. Let's face it. It wasn't even in, it, you know, it wasn't even internally balanced. Because, like, the Iron Warriors and the Emperor's Children were the best armies in it. That's true. Yep. And that was just the end of it. <laughs> that was a problem. This codex, this codex, for one thing, it has clearly been developed in context with the Space Marine Codex. That is so clear because it's the dark equivalent. If you look at things like, for example, the Legion traits, which are the same as the chapter tactics, um, they are the dark equivalents of what you find for the Loyalist Marines, which is really, really yes. cool. Uh, the same is true of the stratagems. In fact, they've got one or two that are the same as the Imperial Space Marines, because they are Space Marines, they're just corrupted by Chaos. But then you've got things like, this is how the Marks of Chaos function now, for example. Uh, the Marks of Chaos, and one thing that, that are sort of classic Chaos players might find a little bit difficult to take when they first read this codex, is that the Marks of Chaos have changed dramatically in terms of how they function and not before time quite frankly we i i, I was personally growing very tired mm -hmm. of just the, the stat increases um especially since they had very limited applications some of them worked some of them didn't um you know like the mark of zeech in the last codex was pretty much useless Let, you know, let's face it it was pretty much useless <laughs> um that doesn't that's not the case anymore because we've got the wonderful keyword system from aos now what the Marks of Chaos do is apply keywords to the units that have them. 
So you, uh, a unit with the mark of chaos, with the, the mark of Nurgle, for example, will have the Nurgle keyword added to it. And what that unlocks in this codex is certain synergies. So you will have certain synergies with certain psychic powers, for example. Um, a unit with the mark of Nurgle can be targeted by the Nurgle-specific psychic power, which is Miasma of Pestilence, which, when cast, name. gives them certain buffs. They can. It's great, isn't it? They can also benefit from the Nurgle specific nice. stratagem, which is fantastic. It's Brilliant. called Grandfather's I mean. Blessings, <laughs> which is great, isn't it? And what it allows them to do, and I tell you, it's, right. it's two command points, but it's bloody brilliant. It allows them to heal mm -hmm. die three wounds per turn that it's used, but it can also restore dead models to the unit. Wow. Is there a limit to what the dead models can be? Uh, no. If they've got the... If, it, Holy I mean, it can, shit. It can, it can only target a, a Heretic Astarte's Nurgle Infantry or Biker unit. So you can't yeah. cast it on, like, Demon Princes or stuff like that. Because okay. that would yeah. be silly. Yeah, to have a resurrected yeah. Demon Prince return to the, the battle with its full wounds. That That's would be what I was thinking. That, uh, mental. That yeah. would be ridiculous. Although, although, do you remember the old um, Chaos Boon table from the, the last codex that everybody hated? Yes. That is in this book, but it's now a stratagem. It's not something you automatically roll on. So, essentially, when a uh, Chaos character kills an enemy character, vehicle, or monster, then you can spend a command point to roll on the Chaos Boon table. And it's all good. It's all good apart from if you get the lowest score, which is spawned them, which is fine. You know, it's kind of fun. Um, but you can become a Demon Prince. And multiple Demon Princes popping up is something your enemy does not want in this new system. No. I can tell you. It's something you don't want in general. In this new system, in this new codex, Demon Princes wreck face. They are evil. It, it's been the case that Demon Princes have been great in the fluff, but terrible in the game for a long time. It's like, it's, it's like almost everything from the Chaos Army, quite frankly, you know? Great yeah, fluff, yeah. terrible application. Not anymore. Demon Princes are one of the best single model units in the game now. They are monstrous. They're absolutely monstrous. Not only that, but they benefit um, from the Legion trait of whatever Legion they belong to. So you not only have Demon Princes that can take um, Warlord artifacts and Sacred Artifacts and that can benefit from the expanded Heretic Astartes Psychic Powers, which are all brilliant, by the way. <laughs> um, you can now have Demon Princes that have things like, for example, the Night Lords... Legion trait, which is evil. The Night Lord's Legion trait is called Terror Tactics, and what that does is that it forces any enemy models in units that are nearby to Night Lord's units to subtract um, from their leadership. So oh. if you've got multiple oh, Night Lord's yeah. units nearby, you can bring their leadership right down. Yeah. And that's bad in this new system. That's really bad because morale is much more significant now. Yes. I, it's much more significant. You can get people leaving the, the table quite quickly with the new you morale can, system. You can table units using yeah. that. And then you combine that with... It's, what I love about the Codex is synergy. Something Chaos has been lacking significantly on the battlefield is synergy. And everything has synergy with everything else. But not only that, they've had a look at the background and looked at what units suit what what traitor legions most so raptors have this wonderful ability whereby they also have this ability called fearsome visage which also causes a negative morale modifier so that in conjunction with the night lord's legion trait is really 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 bad <laughs> it's really bad for the enemy it's great fun, and it makes the Night Lords so much more interesting. It gives them loads of character. Combine that with the Night Lords specific stratagem, which is basically night fighting. It's called In Midnight Clad, which is <laughs> great, isn't it? <laughs> All I'm getting from a lot of what you've said today is chaos. They read yep. really old poetry. 
Yeah, I know. It's so cool, isn't it? Everything, everything is characterful. That's what I like about the army list. It's all fun. Yeah. It's all fun to play. And it's all everything Byron. has application. <laughs> yeah, it's so cool. And everything has application. There are no redundant units. Everything has had a boost. Mm-hmm. The the cult units now are brilliant. Cor- you know really? how corn berserkers, corn berserkers have never been any good. No. Never, never in any system, not even back in second ed, were they any good. They just had great background and terrible, terrible, terrible rules application. Very true. In the new system, (laughs) corn berserkers, you do not want them getting anywhere near your lines. You shoot them. You shoot them fast. Because if you don't, (laughs) they hit your lines like a meat grinder and they just take you apart. They have an awful ability it's so cool called blood for the blood god which basically means in any fight phase they fight twice with all of their quota of attacks holy their crap their full quota of attacks now it gets better mm. you combine that with the world eaters trait yeah which gives them plus one attack on the turn that they charge then you combine that with the world eater specific stratagem, mm. which when played costs a command point, but when played allows them to fight again. Oh god, so three the, times. they could attack three times with plus one. Yep. Holy crap. What's the, the minimum size for a unit? The <laughs> minimum size for a unit is only five, but they can go up to over twenty. No, let's just look at the minimum, right? So, Minimum is five, so yeah. With five units, you how many two attacks? Two attacks, so that's thirty uh plus the one, so plus the one. Th- thirty-five attacks. Yeah. From five Three times. <sighs> Three times. If you play the stratagem. Yeah. Well that's what and I mean. And if they're the... part of the world eaters you... if they're part of the world eaters, then twice, but you know, it's amazing. It's amazing, that is. But you know what else is really fun? Mm-hmm. What they've done is th- all of the synthetic restrictions that the army list operated under, in under the old rules, doesn't exist anymore. So, you can take Rubik Marines, Plague Marines, Noise Marines, and Corn Berserkers in Night Lords armies, in Black Legion armies, in Word Bearers armies, in Alpha Legion armies, oh. and... They benefit from the legion trait of whatever legion you, they're playing as. So it is not the case that all corn berserk, ber, berserkers belong to the world eaters anymore. You've got specific right. berserkers and noise marines for the alpha legion, for the black legion, yeah. and they benefit from their legion trait. That is so cool and opens up the army list massively but also in terms of role playing in terms of background for your for your army so what you could do you could take for example the corn berserkers in a word bearers army and just rejig their fluff a bit to make them a bit more salient to your army yeah. so maybe they could be like dark templars you know sort of like crusading fanaticists or something yeah, yeah. Um, noise marines could be some sort of dark choir or something like that um, some kind of apostle sons. choir yeah yeah Thousand Sons in an Iron Warriors army could be lobotomized, partially robotic Iron Warriors marines. Mm, that's that's tasty. It's so cool. So what- it's so cool. I love that. And it's the way it should have been. It's the way it should have been a long time ago. There is none of this, oh, you can't take these units in a in a in an in an Alpha Legion army. You can't take these units in an Iron Warriors army. The only the only legions that have those restrictions are the cult legions, which makes sense. Mm-hmm. You can't take corn berserkers in an emperor's children army, for example, which makes perfect sense. Of course you can't. That would be stupid. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that, that makes perfect sense to me. Looking at the cult entries just for a moment, there's a, you get an idea here of what's going to be coming in the forthcoming Death Guard Codex, because the Plague Marine entry is massive, it's a whole page, and it's that you should see the amount of weapons they can take now. On top of all their normal options, they've got Blight Launchers, Plague Belchers, Plague Spewers, uh, Bubotic Axes, Flails of Corruptions, Great Plague Cleavers, and Maces of Contagion. On top of their Plague Knives, Plague Swords, Power Fists, and Bolt Guns and Bolt Pistols, and their um, their Specialist mm-hmm. Blight Grenades. So what it looks like is going to happen 
is when the cult specific codices are coming out it looks like the cult data sheets are going to be massively expanded and they're going to get lots of fun toys to play with that's wow how cool is yeah, that the eh? space marine codex sounded like it was a, a work of art the chaos yep. marine codex sounds like it blasts it right out of the water it kind of does i think I mean, maybe it's a case of over overcompensation, but you know what? You know, what? having looked at them, they don't. I wouldn't be afraid as a as a Space Marine player playing against the Chaos Codex. It's very good, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I think in terms of stratagems, if you balance the stratagems out against one another, then yeah, the Chaos the Chaos Marines take it. They've got some really cool stratagems, and in terms of the psychic powers as well, the expanded Dark Hereticus discipline, which now has nine powers in it, by the way. Mm-hmm. Um, is fantastic. And not only that, there's not a redundant spell in it. All of them have application. And the best one, the one that's potentially meta-changing for the whole game is Death Hex. Because Death Hex is a curse that basically takes away the opponent's invulnerable saves. That's cool. It's cool, that's isn't it? It's really, cool. really good. Oh, that's nasty. Yeah. It's a really horrible. On top of that, you've got some old favourites like Gift of Chaos that can turn enemies into Chaos Spawn. Mm-hmm. Um, you've got your God-specific powers, that kind of thing. But I'm not afraid. I, if I were a Space Marine player, I'd be okay with the Chaos Space Marine Codex. And if I were a Chaos player, which I am, <laughs> I'm okay with the Space Marine Codex. I am not looking at these and thinking, oh, crap. You know, I'm thinking that's going to be really interesting. They match. They balance. You can make army lists of varying tiers from both and they work against one another and what i sincerely pray is that that trend continues as more codices come out because it it it's so good it's so lovely to be operating in that sphere again and not to not to feel as though the codex is fighting you yeah that's what i always felt with the 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 last chaos space marine codex i'd be sitting there trying to make army lists out of it just for fun you know to see what i could make and it'd be fighting you you'd be like oh i don't have enough points for that so i've got to drop this and that that lessens the effectiveness and character of this unit so then i've got to do this and i've got and none of that none of that at all you can make so many fun and weird and unwieldy and bizarre armies from this army list that work like for example if you wanted to take a, a like a demon forge army list that consists in almost entirely of uh warp smiths hell drakes hell brutes and demon engines you can do it right (laughs) and it'd be fun it'd be unwieldy yeah yeah. but it'd be fun to play with it's the the joke that we've made a couple of times since the uh, new 40k hit and even before before it was announced that you can take Mm -hmm. an army full of tanks i wouldn't recommend taking an army full of tanks but you can do it Oh yeah, you can do it, and it's and it 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 would be interesting to see yeah. actually. It would be interesting to see how that would work because it's possible now. Try doing that in seventh there. You'd just be blasted off the table oh, first yeah. turn, and that'd be the end. That'd so be the end. So with all this being said, then you're I'm going to assume that you're recommending that people pick up both of these books. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean. At this point, I'm going to be picking up at some point every single codex. That has never been the case before, not no. in any edition of 40k. Going by this, I want to read them. I want to know what's going on out there. Also, the background. The expanded background in these books is fantastic. Not only the new stuff that's going on with the you know, the, the creation of the Cicatrix Maledictum yeah, yeah. and the Chaos Space Marines just pouring into the uh, material universe now. And that is what's happening. Oh, God. This Codex. I mean, that's another thing this Codex does. It moves on the state to play a little bit further. Because the, the Chaos Legions and the Renegades, they are at large now. <laughs> they are in the material material universe and shit is going down i can tell you but it also it also goes into these wonderful details that's never been explored before about the nature of chaos and about how it it touches and warps those that exist within it so for example there's all this detail about how when a, a space marine ends up in the warp or ends up worshipping the chaos gods, they start to experience these physical changes. So not only their flesh, but their armor and their weapons, their machine spirits 
actually become corrupted and become absorbed into their minds. They merge with their machine spirits and become much more warlike. And they become almost demonic in that regard. So cool, isn't it? It is. So cool. It's You can taste all these new things happening around you that, uh, you know, they don't come out and say, you can do this. But the ideas form and it leaves everything open to the, your suggestions and your in, inter- interpretations. Oh, it's it's beautiful. And just like in the Space Marine Codex, you've got a section dedicated to each legion. And after the, the existing history that we all know and love, you've got these little tiny, tiny, like couple of paragraph stories tell just just demonstrating what they're doing now, where they are, what fronts they're fighting on. And there are suggestions of what's coming later. For example, Perturabo's not on Medrangard anymore. Right. He's out there. The Iron Warriors are out there. They have, they've come out. They've come out big time. They're out in the Imperium and they're fighting on a number of fronts. It doesn't state exactly, but there is a suggestion at the end of the Word Bearers that Lorgar is also stirring and is also moving out of his uh, his reclusion yeah. on Sicarius, and you know what it's you know what it's setting up, don't you? They they're saying they're yes. coming. That's what it's saying. It's saying that you will get these guys yeah. eventually. the the cult The cult primarchs will come of course, first. Yeah, well, I've no doubt they, of that. We know Motarion's coming. Um, for the, wor- well, the ways they, of narrative, there has to yeah. be something bad happening for the for the um, imperial primarchs to to arrive. You know, they they have to step in to save the day or else it's pointless just them turning back up. Yeah, and what else can balance yeah, against exactly. them, really, in this universe? It's got to be the, the traitor Primarchs, doesn't it? It's got to be the demon Primarchs. Um, the ne- after Mortarion, I would lay odds on Fulgrim being I next. I think you're probably going to be right there. Because he's the one that's been stirring the most. He's actually already been active in the background. And um, given the the favour that seems to have been shown to Slanesh in this Chaos Codex too, <laughs> I'm telling you, if there's a winner mm-hmm. of this Chaos Space Marine Codex, which is a win all round, Slanesh is it. Do you, do you know what the Emperor's Children Legion trait does? I do not. I really don't. It's awful. It's really good. <laughs> Basically... They always fight first. What? Yeah, always. They always fight first. Oh, It's horrible, isn't it? It's really horrible, isn't it? It's really good. It's really good. On top of that, do you know the Noise Marines have got a new ability now? They don't just carry sonic weapons around. They have... Uh, they have a brilliant ability called Music of the Apocalypse. (laughs) That's a great name. Right? Yeah. When a, a model from a noise marine unit is slain, uh-huh. you don't remove the model. You just flip it on its side to, to show that it's dead. And before they die, before they're removed, at the end, when all mm-hmm. the fighting is done, they can make an extra shooting attack with any weapon they carry, even if they're in close combat. Wow. And then they die. So they get the last hurrah. They... they... Yeah, they have this spasm of, of pleasure. That's what it's demonstrating. They have this sort of spasm of ecstasy as they die. Are you going to be playing any Slaneshi Chaos Marines? Mm-hmm. Oh, my Severed Angels are coming okay. back out of the box. Yeah. Do me a favour. Yeah. Whenever you mm-hmm. use that trait, I want you to go... <laughs> just as you roll the dice. Because <laughs> not only does that, does that keep oh. you in with the... The narrative of the game, it's going to unsettle oh, your opponent so hard. Exactly. Gives them a psychological <laughs> edge. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Or just sort of like an orgasmic <sighs> sigh or something. Or something like that. Ooh. Yeah. Fabulous. Yeah. But you know what? Even the. Cr- you remember the, the, the crap units from the last Codex? Things like the yes, yeah. mutilators yeah. that nobody ever took. Brilliant really? Now. Yeah. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. I would take either of those units in a heartbeat. My God. They're really, really useful now. And I'm gonna I'm gonna be modeling some um Slaneshi mutilators. Definitely. Oh wow. Um the 
Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Because they're so good. <laughs> they're when you so say model, I'm now. assuming that you mean get the green stuff out and really go to town. Oh, yeah. yeah good man. Oh, good yeah. Man. Definitely. Definitely. Oh, here's a lovely detail, too. At the end of the, uh, the Slaneshi Legion section, there's a picture of a Slaneshi Raptor, mm-hmm. right? And it, there's a little thing next to it talking about how the raptor cults of slanesh function and it says he bears a particular blessing of slanesh whereby he can taste through his claws that's an interesting idea it's lovely isn't it i love so, it so when he puts the claws through somebody he can taste the flesh he can and the taste blood. the flesh and the blood and the pain and yeah, yeah it's gorgeous it is absolutely gorgeous the only legions that are not in this book are obviously the death guard and the thousand sons um, mm-hmm. because they are getting their own codices and probably quite... I mean, we know the Death Guard is the next one. That's actually the next codex yes. for release. Um, and the Thousand Sons, we've seen the codex, so that's coming soon. My only mm-hmm. my only hope for the Thousand Sons is that they give them a little bit more and it's not just the units we already know because yeah, yeah. from what we've seen of the Death Guard, they're getting so much. They're getting so much. I think there'll probably be some new stuff, but because... They got so much new stuff towards Mm. the end of 7th, I don't see a huge amount of new stuff. No, my only hope, all I really want for them is a demon engine. I want them to have a specialised demon engine, like a Doom Flyer or a a Lord of Fire, or at the outside, and the one I would hope for the most is a Silver Tower. What if they bring back Doom Rider? (laughs) He can fight (laughs) all! Right on, Doom Rider! That would be kind of fun. Doom Rider! That would be kind of fun. You know what, given the sense of humour that Games Workshop have been injecting into certain models of late, that wouldn't surprise me. It'd make me so happy to see Doom Rider coming back. (laughs) I mean, well, that's what he does, isn't it? He comes and he goes. Um, (laughs) That's very true, (laughs) That's his whole point. With lots of cocaine. Have you seen, like, the (laughs) the internet meme of Doom Rider? I have, yes. (laughs) (laughs) It's great, I love it, where every picture of him, he's sort of snorting cocaine. (laughs) Brilliant. It's a hell of a drug. I mean, I... Yeah, well, given like you know, have you you've seen um, Horticulture Slimax? Yes, I have. The uh, the new Nurgle minister <laughs> of the yeah. AOS. Oh, he's so oh, good. He's brilliant. I, the the sense of humour in that miniature mm, is fantastic. I do love his giant slug thing. Me it's... too, and I love the little Nurgling on the rod yes. that's dangled in front of it. <laughs> It's the little. It's not. It's the little things that make it like it really. Is. Yeah, it's not often that you get a sense of humor in chaos models. I can mm-hmm. tell you, it really isn't. It's been a but long time since that, you had that. It's brilliant, and you know, I kind of hope that's the way they go with the Nurgle demons because it looks like the Death Guard look like they're going to be really grim. Yeah, yeah. They look like they're going to be elaborately grim. They really do look like they're going to be dis disgusting from what we've mm-hmm. seen so it'd be nice if with the nurgle demons they go down the slightly funnier route yeah go on because nurglings are great bring me back my two favorite nurglings the one with his finger right up his nose and the other one yeah. just sitting there flipping the bird yes the one that's flipping the bird you'll never get that no one. we'll never get him again but he's fantastic you'll, you might get the one picking his nose you might get the one picking his nose but you will not get the one flipping the bird it, again it is weird that and weird and slightly childish for how much i love the nurgling that's sitting there picking his nose yeah i like that <laughs> one too there was um i love the ones that came out you know when the 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 current great unclean one came out yes. the um the metal one there was a series of nurglings that came out with him and they're all really cool some one of them looks like it's got a fly's head all right i've not seen these i love them yeah they're lovely the little metal nurglings they're so cool yeah they're very difficult to get a hold of now by all accounts um but they're lovely i they're am really nice hoping managers. for a full rollout of nurgle uh, but oh oh i, I think it'll I happen bet. I think it's going to happen very soon. Yeah. Because I think they're going to do the oh, yeah, same. Oh, yeah, you've got with, Blight War. I think they're going to do the same here with Nurgle that they did with Zench, where they're going to yeah, have no doubt. Um, the 40k and the AOS stuff coming out at the same time. I've no doubt. I think what you're going to see is with Blight War, mm-hmm. you're going to see um, the equivalent of the um, the Disciples of Zeech and the, the Blades of Corn yeah. books. That would yeah. be my guess. And it wouldn't surprise me very soon to see the new Great Unclean Yes, one. I think that's very, good, it, very, very close. It's been teased. Yeah. It's been it's been mooted a long time. And there are people out there who claim to have seen it. Mm-hmm. We'll, we haven't seen yeah. any pictures of it yet. We'll but, wait and see um, on that one. There are people who claim that they have. Yeah. 
I think... Mind you, that said, there are people out there who are claiming that they've seen the Fulgrim model, you know. Really? Mm. Yeah, there are some people who claim that. There, there has been one rumor monger who claims that he's seen quite a few of the... Um, the Primark models, um, and he's been right about a lot of stuff, okay. like a surprising amount of stuff. And he says the best one he's seen is Fulgrim. I can't wait to see a Fulgrim, actually. No. I can't. Fulgrim's always yeah. been my favorite. I mean, I love Magnus. Magnus is fabulous. Yeah. I love Magnus to bits. But in terms of his form, mm -hmm. I love Fulgrim. I think he's beautiful. I mean, he's one of the genuinely beautiful traitor Primarchs. Yes. He's gorgeous to look at. So Illuminating, um, I think the term is, hope, isn't it? It's... Yeah. Well, I hope that comes through in the miniature. I want. I, I do want Fulgrim to be kind of demonically yeah. beautiful, almost angelic, you know? Yeah, that, that, would, be, that would be perfect, I think. Um, but the question is, where does well, it go from that? And when do I get my Lehman Russ turning up? Just like uh, throwing up into a sick bag after being in the warp. <laughs> well, you know what? Odds on. Odds on. Because after... My guess is they're going to be going, as they have thus far, they're going to be going Demon Primarch, Loyalist Primarch, yep. Demon Primarch. So we've got Mortarion coming very soon. So the next... I would lay odds. It's either going to be Lionel Johnson or Lehman Russ. Next. I disagree, actually. I think we're going to see all of the Chaos really? Primarchs before we see another Loyalist. Yeah. Do you think? Yeah. Do you think? Oh, wow, that would be because interesting. Because I, th I think I mean, they need to push the Imperium to the very edge of the tipping point before they can start fighting mm. back. Yeah, so yeah, that's true. So if all the that's Primarchs true. turn up, that pushes the Imperium. But then again, we don't know what the end result for uh, Kandor is going to be, do we? Nope. Because I am yet. sure, Not positive, yet. that the result for Kandor is going to shape what we're going to see because they've said so many times mm -hmm. about uh, that this entire this worldwide campaign is going to have ramifications, and it's not the old style. It's going to have ramifications. Not, no. This is going to have ramifications. There will be. It is actually yeah. going to like dis decide what happens. It, from it this decides point the out. next part of yeah. the story. I am yeah. convinced. If That's cool. Chaos wins, then mm. we're going to see all the Chaos Primarchs. That'd be fabulous. I mean. The other one I'm really waiting for is Lorgar. Yes. Yes. My guess is they'll save him for last because I think I think when Lorgar emerges, it's gonna be like the apocalypse. Yeah. Yeah, it's gonna to... I, I would actually like him to be the focal bad guy. That would be cool. Myself. Yeah, take a button out of the uh, the picture and then just have Lorgar. Yep. Yeah, that would work. I would like that. That would work really well. I would really like that because he is the bad guy. I mean, it would bring him full circle. He's the one who started the heresy. He's the one who effectively mm -hmm. won it, um, and he's done what he wanted to do. I mean, look what the what, he's, what the universe has come to. It's 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 just a playground yeah. for the gods. Yeah. Now, the chaos gods are having a whale of a time at the moment. They don't care that Gilman's back. They're <laughs> well, loving yeah, it. it means that they're getting a bit more events going on out there. They're getting a bit more push, mm. more power. Um, they're getting reminded mm. of why they do this this thing, why they try to corrupt humanity, because the shining beacon uh, well, of humanity one of the just fun... turned up. Absolutely. Mm. I mean, it's one of the fun things that's actually mentioned in the Space Marine Codex, the new one. You get these details about the worlds that were consumed by the Cicatrix mm -hmm. Maledictum and the ones that are just on the border. And this is, there's this massive push by the, the forces of the Imperium to evacuate them, yeah, obviously. Yeah. Um, which is straining resources to breaking point. You know, you get this real sense of desperation yeah. in the current state of play. It does feel like the Imperium is pushed to the very, mm -hmm. very brink, and that nobody expected this. No one expected this to happen. We're going to leave that conversation there, though, because we're I just realized we're nearly at the hour and a half mm -hmm. mark. Uh, <laughs> I think we're, yeah, I think we've, uh, we've but, done uh, well. What then. we're going to finish off, then, is we've got a couple of questions to go through. Uh, which, because I promised everybody Excellent. that when we came back, um, we would get mm -hmm. the questions that were left from last time. And as I have just realised, I have lost the old questions. Um, that's there they are. <laughs> right. Okay, brilliant. So um, I might repeat some of the questions from last times, um, which I apologise for. Okay, okay. But let's see what I can do here. So to start off with, uh, we've. Got do 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 do. No, we don't. Come off. 
Why does technology hate me? <laughs> okay, Paul Anderson has a collection of questions. Okay, okay. Uh, he first asks, weirdest bit of still canon fluff? Weirdest, weirdest bit, bit of fluff. Uh, the weirdest bit oh, in any any system. That's still... Yeah, yeah. I mean, if, if you want to take 40k, I'll take AOS. Yeah, okay, that's still canon. Yeah. <laughs> that's... I could give you like the stupidest bit of fluff, and that that is undoubtedly the ward stuff from the Grey Knights Codex. Um, it's the notion of of Kaldor Drago existing in the warp and not being consumed by chaos. That's just fucking stupid. Um, yeah. I hate that. I really loathe that, and I sincerely hope that's retconned in the current Grey Knights Codex. Um, the weirdest bit. The weirdest bit actually does come from Warhammer for me. It's 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 towards the end of it's the end times. In the end times books, each of the chaos gods physically manifests to a certain degree. Yes. In the in the actual world, in in one of in, I think it's in um, end times. Uh, I can't remember which one it is, but in one of the end times books, Slanesh's hand reaches out of the realm of Slanesh and grabs Morathai and drags her in. It, yes. He actually, like, physically appears. Um, it uh, manifests. Korn's blade. Korn actually hacks yeah. at the old world at one point, and his blade carves through the clouds and carves through the earth and creates these vast chasms and valleys mm -hmm. and things. Um, Nurgle vomits. <laughs> in, in the Glockkin book, Nurgle vomits onto the old world. Um, There's my boy. I can't remember what Zeech does. Uh, he probably didn't actually manifest. He just like sent some stuff yeah. off and went, go on. I can't quite remember what he does. But yeah, that's the weirdest one for me. Uh, for myself, I do have to say the Skaven hitting Lustria with the moon. Yeah, to reiterate. Has to be. Or, uh, yeah, I, I just have to point out that this is a thing that happened and I love it. It is great. Um, but it then, is of course, the Skaven... The Skaven finding the Eldar uh, <laughs> ship. That, I think, is probably my favourite. That is cool. Bit but, of weird fiction. Yeah, I like but that. But I think... Scuttlings. The uh, the Moon Grot... Well, Moon Clan Scuttlings. <laughs> the, the goblins that were... Um, spent too much time in the Silver Tower. <laughs> and they have become more and more like the spiders that they love. <laughs> I, I don't like them. But I, I like the idea of them. Yeah, they're very they silly. Kind of and fun. They are. They creep me out. <laughs> There's something about the eyes that really creeps me yeah, out. Yeah, the multifaceted like eyes. But I think, yeah, it makes me very, very uncomfortable. <laughs> um, it, Paul also asks most overpowered fig, a most overpowered figure. Uh, These days, Nagash. Nagash. <laughs> yeah, it'd have to be Nagash. Overpowered. Or is he just right for he's Nagash? A, I'd say he's just right for Nagash myself. Yeah. But he is... He's OTT. I mean, he's a nightmare. Especially if oh, you yeah. allow him free reign with his summoning rules. He's He can summon armies. You know... Like with, literally summon armies. Literally yeah, summon armies. Or just summon other big miniatures that have horrible capacities, like zombie dragons and things. Um, mm -hmm. He's an absolute nightmare. In in 40k, it's hard to say because of the nature of the you know the game's still quite fresh. Magnus is a beast, even from just his index yeah. uh, entry list. He's an absolute beast. There's lots of um, there are uh, lots of online questions and tutorials about how to beat Magnus in the new 40k because <laughs> uh, he just flies around blatting things with his uh, his yeah. gaze of Magnus, which is how it should be. Um, that's what the Primarch should but, be. I guarantee again, you. More... Is he overpowered or is he no, just right? He's just right for, for Magnus. He he's yeah. just right for Magnus. Mortarion's going to be the Archeon. same. Archeon. Archeon. I'm, I'm actually saying Archeon, he's overpowered. Yeah, Archeon's a he's beast. He's way overpowered. Yeah. But he should be. Yeah, not to that point, I don't think. No, he, I mean, he is, he is a one man army. He yeah. is a one man army. And his command trait. You know, each of the, the characters in AOS has a command trait that they can activate. Yes. His yeah. is stupid. <laughs> it's, yes. It's ridiculous. Basically, what what you want to do in an army with Archaon is just make it full of characters, full of chaos characters, all of which have their own command traits, because his allows 
every other command trait in the army to be activated in the same turn, one yeah. after the other. Ridiculous. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that that's that's the galaxy reset button right there of it, AOS. It is. That is it's the most brilliantly overpowered command trait mm -hmm. I've ever seen. Uh, and possibly quite possibly the most overpowered rule I've ever seen in any I game system. I think it quite is. Quite possibly. So yeah, that, that's my answer. Um, <laughs> he's definitely the most overpowered. Paul also asks, the most yep. overpowered army? Depends on what what yeah, edition that, of what system tough one, isn't it? you go for. The thing is, with AOS and with the new 8th Ed 40k, they've obviously gone out of their way to balance the armies. So it's not you're going to have to look back. You're going to have to look back. And I would say in the whole history of 40K, the most overpowered armies have been Tyranids yes. in second ed. <laughs> Tyranids in sixth the... ed, honest governor. <laughs> Ty Tyranids in sixth ed. Warded. Um, death, uh, the Grey Knights in fifth mm -hmm. and fourth ed. Um, the 3.5 Chaos Space Marine Codex in um, yeah. third ed. And in the last edition, if for sixth and seventh ed, it would have been the Craft World That's Elder true. and the Space Marines. Without a shadow of a doubt, Craft World Elder above and beyond anyone else. They were nightmares. I would also say in Age of Sigma, as much as I love them to bits, the Iron Jaws. The Iron. Oh, the Iron Jaws are, are good. Meat grinders. The only thing that's not in their yeah, favour is very good. speed. It takes them a while to get anywhere, yep. but when they get there, they are meat grinders. They, they really are. They really are nasty. Um, a lot of their rules remind me of. Uh, they've been like carried over, which I really like, into like the index. Yes, yeah. Orc uh, in forty k, which I really like. Like I, I, I only read recently their morale list, their WAG special rule. Which basically means that you treat the leadership of units as the number of models yes. in the unit. Yeah. That's mental. It's madness, isn't it? That makes them more or less immune to morality. Depending on how many, yeah, how many it's units, really how clever. many models you've got left in that unit. Yeah. It yeah, is. it's very clever. Um, I like it He also asks lot. for weakest army. Yeah. Again, depends on in edition. In modern editions, um, in 40k, I don't know. There isn't one, really. They're pretty all well-balanced yeah, against one are. another. There really isn't one. In 8th Ed 40k, there isn't one. In the last edition, um, Chaos Space Marines yeah. and Sisters of Battle. They, those were the weakest armies um, back. Uh, and Dark Elder. In 7th Ed, Dark I Elder were crap. I think they Dark Elder terrible. probably would win this one as well for 8th, because they didn't no, seem to have I mean, a they, huge they amount going for them. Mm. But then again, I have only boost, scanned it, I've so no I'm not quite sure. They will have a boost. Um, yeah, yeah. But it's it's difficult to say because the game system is such that it's very difficult to make killer armies anymore. And there's a lot more based on strategy and tactics and luck as well. <clears throat> In AOS, um, yes. yeah. I don't know. Um, Again, it depends. It's very difficult to say. The um, the flesh eater courts. Mm, yeah, I mean, yeah, they are. I mean, they they've got some stuff mm, going for them, but some of the builds that you can do with them don't much. Seem to have no, they're they're more of a fun much. army than a a hard hitting one, yeah. aren't they? The flesh eater courts. Seraphon, just because it'll upset some of the listeners. There we go. Seraphon. Um, Seraphon. And then finally, yeah. Paul Anderson asks: Nurgle, Zench, Corn. Snog, marry, kill. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Snog, Zeech, marry, Nurgle, kill, corn. He also says, I did not include Slanesh. You, you see, Nurgle all, would make a great spouse. Them in that one. Yeah. No. Yes. <laughs> you do it all. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Slanesh is the affair. Slanesh is the the affair, definitely. Um, but Nurgle would make a great spouse. I think so. I'd, I'd quite happily be married to, to Nurgle. Yeah. Yeah. Very stolid, very dependable, very affectionate, you know? Owns his own house. Owns his own house and land. 
Yeah, you know, yeah, owns yeah. his own garden, very lovely to his kids. So yeah. you know, a good guy. Yeah, all in all, yeah. all in all, no a, a decent material. guy. You know, so he's good marriage material. <laughs> you don't want to marry Slanish. Well, that'd be, no, that's, no. that'd be a nightmare. And then um, she's just gonna like, Dad, it's not gonna work. Is it'll be divorced before you know it, and then. Well, the thing about Zish is he's just too... He's into too many things. Yeah, so That's the problem yeah, with Zish. Yeah. And then Corn, um, Corn, you just... yeah, let's Anger management yeah, problems. It's not really worth that, doing. That's an abusive relationship. It is, happen, it is, yeah, is. yeah. It's kind of like mine and Sega's relationship. Um, <laughs> you know, although... <laughs> or, although Sonic Mania, which I still don't have, because it's not out uh, on PC until the 29th. Got to get it. It's really, As really soon as good. it's out on PC, I will have it. You know what? Oh. It's it's probably my favourite Sonic game. Shut up! Yeah, I know. <laughs> I will <laughs> shoot really you in the head. Weird. It's really <laughs> good. <laughs> Stop it! Uh, Fucking monster! Uh, um, yeah. Right, uh, Carl Thurgood has so Carl Thurgood <laughs> has some questions as well. Yeah, bastard. Um, he says <laughs> worst current miniature. The mutilators. Yes, I'd agree with that. Oh. Those things are so lazy. Mm-hmm. The green stuff worker. I'm not very good at the green stuff. You know, I'm very my 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 green stuff abilities are very very minimal. But I can see the work on them. Yes, I can see what marks have been made and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And I say like, I could do better than that. Yeah, yeah. It's, They're I keep, terrible miniatures. I did look at a few of them um, a little while back when I first got back into everything, and I did mm-hmm. think I really want to buy a few just to improve mm-hmm. them. Yeah, just to improve them. They are terrible miniatures for yeah. such a cool concept mm-hmm. as well. For something that could look so good. In fact, you know what? The entire Chaos range, apart from the new stuff, that's something that needs to happen. We need new miniatures across the board. Yeah. That's the only negative thing about this release, the fact that there are no new miniatures. It will come. I've no doubt it will come. And they're staggering the releases, I know, and they've got a lot on their plate at the yeah. moment. But come on, we need core units we need new chaos space Marines. we need new chosen we need new characters we need new special characters we need new everything we need a new abaddon we Re- do and that really badly need a new abaddon yeah we do because he wrecks face in the new codex and the miniature yeah. just doesn't warrant it no no because he's so tiny he's, i mean he's he's a bastard yeah. he's a bastard he can he can take out units on his own mm-hmm. i can be- i can believe it he's he should be that, though. He should be a one-man mm. walking destroyer. Yeah, he's the arch messiah. Yeah. He's the arch messiah of chaos. So yeah, it is weird how much Definitely. I like a button, but hate Archeon. Yeah, it's weird, isn't yeah. it? I do too. I love Abaddon. Mm. And you know what it is? Abaddon's characterized. Archeon is just a bad guy. Yeah. That's all he yeah. is. There's nothing to him. He is the arch villain. He's the embittered arch villain. Yeah. Abaddon isn't. Especially if you read the Talon of Horus book, he's a really interesting character. He's more like a sage. Yes. Yeah. He's not like he's not just bitterness and anger. He's actually really considered, mm-hmm. and a, he treats his warriors bizarrely well. <laughs> well, yeah, it's strange because if you treat your warriors well, especially superpowered space marines who have defected mm. to chaos, the last mm. thing you want them is for them to turn on you. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. So he treats Although them well. He does treat them well, yeah. I mean, okay, it's a, chao- it's, it's a chaotic hierarchy, mm-hmm. so you prove yourself or you're going to end up dead anyway because yes, someone that. else will kill you to take your place. Um, and he absolutely encourages that. Um, yeah, but, but you don't want an entire traitor cool. legion turning against you, do you? Well, in case of the Black Legion, it wouldn't even be an entire traitor legion. The Black Legion have now swollen. They eclipse all of the other traitor legions put really? together. Oh, wow. Yeah. They are huge. Oh, They're cool. like the old legions. The Black Legion are, as bi- are bigger than even one of the old legions now. Mm-hmm. That's, so, that's really yeah. cool. You don't want them fracturing and turning against no, no, no. Um He also asks, worst character, model or stats-wise? Archeon. Model, <laughs> stats-wise Archeon, Archeon, yeah. Model, um... Worst uh, character, Abaddon. I mean, it's going to have to be Abaddon for me. Abaddon, that... yeah. I mean, it's a strange thing, isn't it? Because that miniature was great when it came out. Oh, yeah. When it came out 25 it years really, ago. When it came out 25 years ago, it was great. But it has, just hasn't aged no. well. It doesn't fit anymore. No. In fact, you know what? Every one of the Chaos Space Marine characters, apart from Huron, Blackheart, and the new Khan, and the new Araman, mm-hmm. 
um, apart from that all of the Chaos characters need replacing, uh, which is happening. I mean, we've seen the new Typhus. We've seen a glimpse of him. Um, so, you know, it is happening. I'm actually going to say, in AOS, the worst character, models and stat-wise, is Skarsnik. Because Skarsnik? He's, because oh. he's not in Age of Sigma, and his lack no. of model hurts me. His lack yeah, of stats it's... hurts me. It hurts me that Skarsnik of the Eight Peaks died an ignoble yeah. death. Yeah, I would have liked to have seen Skarsnik there, back. There myself. is no way in hell you could bring Skarsnik back. It's like saying Thanquil could no. turn back up. It can't. They yeah. are long dead. They are dead, 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 dead. But it hurts me that he didn't just go out like yeah. on a meteor. That you know, Sigma went off and found the dragon mm. at the center of the universe. Yeah. And Skarsnik didn't just like <laughs> turn up rolling around on a meteor going, mm. You didn't get me, did you? <laughs> because Skarsnik yeah. is my boy. He is amazing. Yeah, I, uh... I kind of feel the same way about Egrim Van Horstman. Do you remember yes, him? Yes, holy shit. You know? Yeah. He was a fantastic miniature at one time, mm. um, but he's got such an ignoble end in the <laughs> End Times books. He tries to absorb the um, the power of light, the, um, the, the, the wind of light magic, and it doesn't work. It blows him up. <laughs> him, <laughs> he just goes pop. Emily Kemler. Oh, you know, yeah, I, lo- that, I love That miniature him. is fantastic. and I love so it. So basically, Carl, you're, uh, the worst characters are the ones who died in the end times and aren't in Age of Sigma. Yeah. Pretty much. Because yeah. their lack of model hurts me. <laughs> it actually does hurt their lack of presence. I would yeah. definitely like to have seen Heinrich back because I love him. Oh, he was so He's great. One of my- one of my favorite characters you know i love the fact that he for half of his life he's this demented deranged old man mm-hmm. um and then he gets his sanity back he's gifted his sanity back and then he's still a horrible deranged old man <laughs> it just so happens that he's got necromantic powers i just love the fact that he just dribbles and throws and pukes and you know, <laughs> yeah it's and so he's just cool. like raising skeletons it. as he's doing so he is a proper tramp but with necromantic Do powers you know, he, that's right he is a proper tramp isn't he he's like he's like gandalf he's like the dark it, version he's of more gandalf like you know, tramping Ron, all over yes. the place yeah, bugger yeah. and bugger it's millennium hand and shit <laughs> race skeleton race skeleton yeah. <laughs> Van Hal's Dance Macabre. Yeah. That's it. Do you know what really sold me on him? Mm. There's a bit of artwork from one of the old um, Warhammer Fantasy roleplay books of him. Yes. And he's in his lab and he's reading from a book and he's got a skeleton attendant next to him and it's wearing his yes. hat. <laughs> oh, I love him. Just... That just that does it for me. I, I that I love that. I love I'm it. I'm gonna try and find that picture, I think, and put it up on the group. It's such a Oh yeah, because it's such a cool picture. Yeah. It's such a cool picture. Oh man. Um Christopher Carlson asks, Is it wrong that I'm sort of glad they blew up the old world? No. Mostly because as a lizard man main player, I got real sick of everything <laughs> important going on. You got hit by the moon twice uh, i got sick of everything important going down in the northeast whilst my scaly bros yes. were stuck in the southwest too long didn't read yeah. fuck you old world i'm glad you're dead there i said it p.s i do go deeper with the why of this hate just ask but it comes down to my favorite race and army being excluded from base from basically everything until what total warhammer 2 <laughs> You know what? I, I think we've discussed this before, haven't we? And although we were both sad to see the old world go, it was so necessary. It was. It was, it was a bloated beast that nobody knew yeah. what to do with. It was boring. It was so stolid and stodgy. Mm-hmm. Um, it was like a big old British pudding that had been sat on the table for too long and had started developing skin and nastiness it just didn't work anymore no. it needed doing and i'm really glad that it's been done and i really like the realms yeah. um i like the dynamic of them and i like the fact that it's gone from being sort of grim dark fantasy to being like prog rock album it, yeah cover it's become balsa goth you know which yeah here, the court of atlanteans like stand it, forever you know? mightiest of warriors we yeah. sail across the sea yeah, it, it, i yeah, like I love that. it um not really a question, but okay. Um, I, I, the problem I've got with the lizard men at the moment is that there isn't a place for them as such. The Seraphon are terrible. Mm. Um, I'm going to come yeah, out yeah. and say that. The Seraphon are awful. The, mm-hmm. the Pestilence book kind of makes them a bit more interesting by having them remember every single death that they have when they're 
sent down <laughs> onto um, into the realms. Oh, <laughs> but, you know, they don't quite understand what's happening, but the slan follow you know push them into battle and and stuff mm. like that. And I do love the slan; I think they're fantastic. But the uh-huh. the demons of order that are being stored in spaceships, it mm. it doesn't work for what they look like on the on the tabletop. No. It- they need a massive i mean they're going to need a massive army wide rejig aren't they yes um to work and when they do if they do and assuming they're not just slowly left behind out of the system um i imagine if as and when the seraphon do occur again they're going to be something very I different at least aesthetically so um i mean we talked about this when uh, we met up in in birmingham the, the, we did we both think that the seraphon are going to be slowly pushed out of Warhammer you just mm. you won't see another Seraphon book or I I don't think or, so either I would be or surprised or new Seraphon miniatures that book's there if you want to use it but I don't yeah. think you're going to see a lot of them which is I, a shame I concur but as you say, they need to be completely changed to work. They do. My guess is, if they do bring them back, then they'll be full on slan. Yes, I think yeah. they they might bring the slan back Please. as a race, and they will replace the the lizard. That would make men. me really happy because I love my bastard frogs. <laughs> it's all your fault, frogs. Yeah. It's all your fault. Every yeah, it is. It is all their fault. Everything is yep, their fault. They started it in both worlds. Um, yeah. It's all there. Christopher fault. Carlson also asks, "What are the odds that Belarius Crawl turns out to be an Eldar?" Not he high. seems dickish enough, for um, or at least being in league with the Cabal I, from the Horus Heresy. I don't think it's very high, but I he is in league with the Eldar mm-hmm. and is is one of those rare specimens of the Imperium that doesn't seem to mind aliens very much. Um, I think it's more likely that he may have been influenced by the Eldar, maybe sort of, or even by Necrons or some other outside... Uh, I mean, we know he's already been influenced by the Necrons, thanks to certain um, details in the Gathering Storm yeah. books and his encounters with Traz in the Infinite. And we know he's been influenced by the Eldar, too. Um, I don't think it's high that he is an Eldar, um, but I do think he is a very disruptive element in the Imperium, and I think he's playing a very long game Indeed, because mm-hmm. he's been alive since the heresy, he has. and he's been planning for this this state of affairs. He he has known since the heresy that this state of affairs would come about. Yeah, which is interesting. It makes you wonder what else he's predicting. Yes, it really does. There's an interesting little response to that by the brilliantly named Fritz van Dijk. Um, mm-hmm. If I'm mispronouncing that, Fritz, I do apologise. Um, Cole is a chaos demon playing mind games with Rabuti, trying to usurp his father so his brothers will wage war on him, divide the Empire, and the Eternal Emperor gets sucked back into the wall mm-hmm. and most likely becomes a chaos god. Beware of Cole uh-huh. and Rabuti. They bring far too many gifts to be trusted. How mm-hmm. good is that last sentence? Yeah. That's very cool. It's very nicely written as well. Oh, um, I like yeah. that. That's very yeah. cool. I like that mm. a lot. Yeah. I think that is actually more likely than him being like an Eldar or an alien. Um, it's possible that maybe he's a plant of like the Necrons or the Eldar or something like that. But I don't think he actually is. No, I don't think he's Eldar at all. An alien. Uh. And I love him as well. I really want to use that uh, that sentence for something. Well, yeah, yeah, it's good, isn't it? Um, I really love Belisarius yes, Call as well. He's a beautiful character. Yeah, it, and his miniature is fantastic. The miniature is great. And him as a character, he's just wonderful. Yeah. Just beeping and like beeping. He walks lot. around doing stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and he seems so distant from things. Yeah. That's what I like. In the books, he's so distant from things because... He is so much machine, and he's seen yes. everything. He's been alive for so long that it's nothing really impresses him very much. Uh, right, so last two questions. Christopher Napier, the beautiful Chris, says, Do we think mm-hmm. the seeds of a new schism in the Imperium have been sh- there have been sown in the fluff for 8th edition? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yep. Mm. Yeah, we do. We've we discussed have many this, times, and yes, um, without a yeah. doubt. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. 
I, I think I, I would be surprised given the narrative threads that they've dropped. My storyteller's craw is telling me that the little suggestions, the little narrative threads, they're setting up two Imperiums. Yeah. They're setting up the one on the uh, one side of the uh, Cicatrix Maledictum, which is the Primaris, um, Imperium mm-hmm. Primaris. And they're setting up the one on the dark side of the uh, the Cicatrix Maledictum, which is Imperium Secondus. And it's going to be the conformant chapters versus the very non-conformant yeah. chapters. Um, and I think it's going to result potentially in, if not... It's a very fractious relationship, then potentially all out civil war. Yes. I don't think it's going to get to civil war. Um, I think it. No, you think it's going to be more sort of political? I think it's going to be very political because if you've got civil war between the uh, the two imperiums, then you've just got another chaos army. Actually, that's a fair point, yeah. And also, chaos would just win, wouldn't it? They would just fall on them. So, yeah, but it is going to be fractious. Um, I'm not sure who's going to be leading the um, Imperium Secondus. I think there's going to be a lot of squabbling for that because you're going to have Lehman Russ and Lionel Johnson yes. on the same side um, and they both hate one another. So mm. that's going to be tricky. Or you could, uh, you may have the situation whereby the Space Wolves don't align with them at all and become a rogue element. Yeah, I mean, that's a strong... I, I can see Space Wolves and uh, Blood Angels teaming together and, mm-hmm. you know, we are the yeah. new... Yeah, they don't... Yeah, they don't have any particular no. problem with one another as such. Um, although, um, it's certainly something that was almost set up in the War of Magnus, you know. I mean, you did have the Dark Angels bombing that's Fenris. True, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Which probably didn't go down yeah, terribly yeah, well. It was a little bit of a bombing between <laughs> brothers, you know. Yeah, and also a lot of the Space or yes, Secrets are out true. now as well. The... Um, Everybody knows about the uh, the Wolfen yeah. now, um, which makes them look like massive hypocrites, which mm-hmm. they are. That's why I like them. They bloody oh, yeah. are. <laughs> the galaxy's biggest hypocrites. That's why I love them. They, uh, I like the idea of anybody who can't keep a secret and does so <laughs> that badly, oh. you know. <laughs> oh, well, in that case, the Dark Angels... Oh, no, they've managed then, to keep know? their secret. They, you know? Oh, they have, but I don't think no, they're going to keep no, it for very not. long. I've got a funny feeling one of the things that's going to move them on when they come out is that I think there's going to be more people mm-hmm. who know. There's definitely going to be more people who know. I mean, Roboot's got to have his suspicions that's because true. of Cypher. Yeah. Yes. He's got to have his suspicions because he definitely recognised Lion's sword um, and definitely recognised the heraldry and didn't like him at all. Didn't like Cypher no. at all. But uh, knew that he was going to help him get to the, the point where he needed to get. Yeah. That's it, yep. and then betrayed him. Robo <laughs> betrayed him first. <laughs> I kind of like that. You, you instantly think it's going to be the other way around, but no, no. The girly yeah, man yeah. jumps right in. You're waiting. Yeah, I was quite surprised at that. I really was, because he seems such an honourable guy. And it's like, um, yeah, I know I said this, but no. <laughs> um, final question, Off you go. then, uh, and we'll get this close-up for the night, is from Christopher Napier, and he mm-hmm. says, is there room in 40K for a return, stroke, advent of new races that are parallels to the dwarfs yeah. or Skaven? Yes. Yeah, yeah, because the, the 40K universe is is not only so vast, but with the eruption of the Cicatrix Maledictum, you've now got potentially infinite worlds and states and conditions. So, yeah, well, the, anything's possible. The, um, one anything's of the things is possible. that uh, time moves differently inside the rift, doesn't it? So there is absolutely no reason yeah, why you can't exactly end does. up with a um, a squat homeworld, one of the... Uh, what the hell are they called? No. Uh, anyhow, one of their worlds just turning up out yeah, of the yeah. past. Before Absolutely, the, there's no reason why the not Tyranids at all. got them. Yeah. And, you know, yeah, and the galaxy, even without the Cicatrix Maledictum, the galaxy is oh, so yeah. vast, and there's so many worlds and systems and things in it. Yeah, you're bound to find something like rat men and. Um, like, uh, well, you know, rat men. I mean, I'm sure there must be that kind of mutation knocking scavengers. about in the Eye of Terror and on the demon good, world. Good old scavengers. Yeah, why not? It's, I do miss the uh, the <laughs> rud being the scaven like, but oh well. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, no, they're not. I don't think they are anymore. Although they're they're mentioned again, you know, they 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 seem to be mentioned a yeah, lot. Yeah, I think they're lately. really going to be turning up at some point. I think they probably will. They'll probably be one of the newer races mm-hmm. that turn up. Um, but yeah, there's no reason why not. I mean, the squats definitely have potential to be knocking about. Yeah, and I, I think it's they're going to turn back up. I, I really do think that we're going to see the squats turn back up again, um, just to make Chris really, really happy, because I know how much he loves the squats. <laughs> uh, also, hey, Chris, how goes that uh, Codex Space Skaven? You, you're doing all right with that, mate? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's going to do us, man, because we're nearly at the two-hour mark. I think that's uh, yeah. We've rambled on. I don't know how we've managed to get to the two-hour mark, but it's just one of those things that happens. It just tends to happen, doesn't it? There's so much to talk about. Like I say, that's so the problem. So the next uh, episode that we're going to do is going to be back to the usual format. So we'll have a guest on, and we'll do the the usual mm-hmm. bits and bobs with them. However. I have Fabulous. a question to send out, and I'm going to put this onto the Facebook group as well, so please get onto the group and join in to answer my questions. The, the question I'm going to ask is, I want to know your game stories. Originally, um, this was going to be about Necromunda, with Necromunda coming out. I wanted to hear about Necromunda's uh-huh. stories, but I realised that maybe not everyone's played Necromunda, so I just want to hear stories from battles yeah. that stick in your mind, the, the tales that really jump out of some of the things that have happened um you know it's oh the crazy just, stuff the crazy the, stuff just the yeah. ones that stick in your mind it could be the crazy it could be a really yeah. decisive win it could be a decisive decisive loss uh-huh. it just the that unit that just yeah. wouldn't die no matter I mean, what you um, threw at it uh, a good example is that one of my um, my weird boys for uh, my auric iron jaw army uh, good old black tooth he does not miss with the foot of gork in every game I've ever played with him, he hits with the foot of gore. The other, the, the other two shamans I've got, fab. not a chance. No, miss. But no, he has but never, he missed, never yet. misses. Yeah, and so much so that every time he kills somebody in a battle, I paint another green foot onto his little, uh, onto his clothes. <laughs> That's fab. It reminds me of um, a battle I had a long time ago. It was back in. Um, third ed 40k with one of my regular gaming partners and i played death guard back then which was really good um he his a single space marine attack Uh bike right held up it must have been at least five (laughs) units the entire game and we're including a dreadnought a plague bearer squad a chaos sorcerer a unit of plague marines and a chaos lord rolling all their attacks against this single attack bike and we just could not you know what it was it. don't you it was just it was pretty Bolder. heresy doom rider <laughs> that must have been what it was that must couldn't have been what it was, was already gone. couldn't kill it the hero of the <laughs> battle and it became to the point where i just forgot about the battle and i was just fascinated by mm-hmm. this bike by the end and i was ignoring all the mission parameters and just chucking everything at it, that's, trying to kill it. That's amazing. And it just wouldn't die. <laughs> I love it. I love that. That's the kind of thing I love. I think that is so much fun. So I think with all that being said then, uh, George, what would you like to quickly pimp out yes, before sir. we close down? Oh, well, there is a um, a reprint of Strange Playgrounds, my short story collection, available on my Amazon page. Um, there is also my joint project with the photographer Nick Hardy, um, Born in Blood, which you can, uh, the, you can purchase volume one. There are going to be six volumes, and you can purchase volume one from uh, Strange Playgrounds. Also, congratulations, com. Nick. Yes, massive well, he congratulations has now got a small, small son who is incredibly tidy. It's so tiny. Incredibly oh, tiny. It's, like, it's just so tiny. It's just, it's just, um, <laughs> what? Yes, mm, yes. Um, yep. <laughs> but yes, congratulations, Nick. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Round of applause for you, man. We're all very, very happy for you. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, as for myself, you can find my work here. You can find it at youtube.com forward slash grufflock. You can find it at rivetedsounds.co.uk, which things have been a bit quiet on there of late because I'm busy with the real day job trying to make money. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
that annoying uh, stuff. I wish you know? could buy nice things. It's not. It's just to get the bills paid. Um, and you can find my <laughs> stuff at gruffnexus.weebly.com. You can also find me, if you are so interested in the macabre and the weird, at The Creeks, uh, which is thecreeks.weebly.com, ah. um, where we're actually about to change up the uh, the format a little bit and actually go and start recording in a haunted tower, which I can't wait for. Oh, yeah. Really? Um, the entire idea That's of that brilliant. is that three men and a lot of beer sit in a room and try to unravel a conspiracy huh. or some kind of paranormal situation, um, and we're not allowed to leave <laughs> until we've worked it out. Uh, the ah, Greeks is brilliant. one of my favourite things I've ever done, mostly because I am smashed by the end of it. <laughs> it's so much oh, thank fun. You. I like thank the Greeks you. a lot. I have to say, I loved the Derek <laughs> chorus. But George, is he here? Loved it. Is he fiend or villain? <laughs> oh, he's a twat, is what he is. Uh, we've actually got one coming up in the not too distant future that I think you might really enjoy. Then it's a. Uh... It, oh. it, it's it's um, somebody who <laughs> is to it. Derek Akora levels of twattishness. <laughs> oh, good fun! It's good fun! Together. I'll look forward to that. Anyhow, <laughs> oh, God. so with all that being said, oh, and of course you can find. I've got more cult power <laughs> in my pinky. Friction, friction, friction is the way. So with all that being said, you can find these shows at thefluffandhammer.weebly.com. And we are out of here so I can get out of this room that has no air in it. Bye-bye. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Brilliance.